fourth topic for exam two is the central dogma. So what we're going to do here is take all the information we picked up from topic B, anything from chemical reactions, from bonding, into building of macromolecules, including things like dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis, to build our final macromolecules, DNA, RNA, and protein, to produce life. Reminding everybody that proteins, since this is where we start, are macromolecules that are built from monomers to polymers using dehydration synthesis, and that each individual protein has an individual function or multiple functions, that they're all based specifically on their three-dimensional structure. No structure, no function. But this particular topic is going to deal with how we produce them, what are the instructions to make them, how are they made, and what exactly is more in detail of their composition. The main idea here of the central dogma is going to be based on three concepts or three components, DNA, RNA, and protein, and the three processes involved in this, which are going to be replication, transcription, and translation. And the idea that this all revolves around a cycle in which DNA acts like the blueprint or the carrier of genetic information, which then needs to be decoded by a process called transcription into RNA, which is the decoded message that can be understood by ribosomes to produce protein. So that idea puts together the entire concept of central dogma as the source and order of all genetic information, turning it into something functional. Here on the slide, we represent visually what that central dogma is, starting with DNA, which is usually found in a eukaryotic cell inside the nucleus versus a prokaryotic cell in the nucleate region. And DNA undergoes the first process called replication to make more of itself and more cells. And then it needs to be decoded by a process called transcription into RNA. That is the version that most living things can use to understand and produce protein. And then that further is decoded by a process called translation into the functional units of life called proteins. Reminding everybody that this is a cycle because it is those proteins that perform all those processes mentioned. Replication is performed by a protein called DNA polymerase, transcription by RNA polymerase, and translation itself is performed by a combination of protein and RNA called ribosomes. In this first section, we're going to look at how protein is made in detail. Obviously, there are plenty of examples of proteins. What do they do? Most of us have heard variations behind them. The idea, however, is that they do have specific shapes. And depending on what the shape is, they perform different functions. In topic B, we learned how proteins are built from monomers to polymers utilizing amino acids, both having a carboxylic acid on one side an amino terminus on the other side, and usually having this R group or variable group that made 20 available amino acids slightly different from one another. So we know that based on the R group or variable group, there's 20 naturally occurring amino acids and several more synthetic ones. And out of those 20, there are about nine that are so-called essential simply because we cannot produce them. That means we usually have to obtain them from an additional source, usually by consuming them. Amongst those variations, though, we can divide the amino acids into groups based on their properties. So that means some of them can be acidic or basic, some of them can be neutral or electrically charged. And depending on those R groups, they will interact with each other within the protein to produce different shapes. As they start interacting, we get a series of levels or structures that indicate how complex the protein gets. One amino acid undergoes dehydration synthesis and combines with a second amino acid and so on and so forth. What we call a primary sequence. This means literally the order in which each amino acid is being linked to one another. So just as much as we can talk about several letters in an alphabet and talking about an A, B, C, and D in that particular order, a primary sequence literally means that. It is a specific order of the amino acids in that chain. Now, as these chains start to fold with one another because of those R groups, they start achieving a three-dimensional structure. Typically, the hydrogen bonds present between the amino and the carboxylic acid group produce two typical shapes. The first one is called an alpha helix. The second one is known as a beta pleated sheet. Both of these kind of side-by-side -side get unique looks or three-dimensional shapes. And as they start combining with one another, tertiary structure in which part of the R groups or the variable groups, additional hydrogen bonds, and other chemical interactions like ionic bonds, 
and disulfide bridges all start building what we call a tertiary structure. This is more or less the overall three-dimensional shape of the protein, so it now takes a full-blown shape from it. However, this is not necessarily the only shape it can take. Sometimes they can continue to interact with additional proteins into what we call a quaternary structure, meaning multiple proteins interacting with one another. Probably the typical example that most people are familiar with is hemoglobin in the blood that is composed out of four separate proteins assembled into a much larger structure. So on the lower right hand side, we see kind of the step-by-step -step assembly into these larger structures, going from the first sequence or the primary structure, which is literally just the order, into the secondary structure, into alpha helices and beta sheets, which are in this case, the interactions of hydrogen bonds between those same amino acids. And then ultimately, those secondary structures assemble into these final tertiary structures or three-dimensional shapes. Nonetheless, those three-dimensional shapes can interact with additional three-dimensional shapes to form into what we call a quaternary structure. So if we just keep on trying to define, proteins and their shapes are how we determine function. As we start giving them shapes, we categorizing them into two typical shapes or structures referred to as the globular ones, which look spherical, or more fibrous ones, which are usually thin and long. Now, depending on which type of these do they fall into, most of them, the globular ones, end up having some sort of activity that they can perform, whereas the fibrous ones end up being more structural to build things or hold things together. However, based again on their three-dimensional shape, it's important to maintain it because any disruption of that quaternary structure or the uh, ones below, tertiary and secondary, can completely destroy their ability to function, what we learned as denaturation in the past. And this can be performed by various different methods. Easiest one to use is temperature or heat, or the association with certain organic solvents, which easily destroy hydrogen bonds. Also, acids and bases based on their electricity can disrupt the protein shape. And similarly, heavy metal ions, so in this case, things like iron and copper can all disrupt these proteins simply because of their large charges. And then, similar to heat, the process of agitation by moving things constantly in high velocities increases heat, which in turn also denatures things. This is nothing that is outside the ordinary. Performance of denaturation occurs in daily life all the time by destroying proteins that are performing a function simply by adding either heat or an acid by pretty much everyday activities. So now that we've kind of looked at proteins, we now need to know where the signals, the information, and the instructions are to build those proteins themselves. 